I'm deeply sorry, Mr. Bryan. It's all right, Doctor. I already knew. You have at least nine months left. Perhaps as much as 18. But the first doctor gave me from one to two years. I hope he's right. What are you going to do? Well, I have no family. I haven't taken a day off since law school. Guess I'll try to squeeze 30 years of living into one or two. You didn't hopeless, Mr. Bryan. Research is being done, and you'll be in good health until the last few weeks. So always let us know where you are. character for you, isn't it, Marty? Mm. So is breaking a leg. You're feeling better. I feel the same as I told you I felt last night. Mad. You read the transcript? Yeah, you had me in tears. Good. Then you'll take over for me. No. That's just... Did you say no? Marty, your client needs an experienced criminal lawyer with me on the case. You could wind up in the gas chamber. Not a chance. If there was, I wouldn't have sent for you. <laughs> In two days, the trial will be over. And a few hours later, we'll have us a verdict. Not guilty. Now, uh, you did send me the right transcript. You are defending Louise Bro. Hmm. And getting her off. Marty, she killed her husband. The housekeeper hears them having a top of the lungs quarrel, right? Here's somebody slam out of the house. A few minutes later, comes downstairs and finds his body. Now, stop me if I get any of this wrong. Mrs. Broad is found in a bar nearby. Is arrested. Confesses she killed her husband. Is taken down to headquarters where they advise her of her rights. But she insists on making a second confession. Signs it. And the confession is admitted into... You did read every word. And since you hate to lose, you decided to break your leg and send me to the slaughter. <laughs> Stop. You finally got it wrong. I sent for you to keep one of my colleagues, spell that competitors, from stepping in and taking my bows. <laughs> There's a folder in that drawer over there. Bring it to me. The one marked, Dr. Stanley Brickow. Dr. Stanley Brickow, take the stand. State your name. Stanley J. Brickow. You may take the stand. Dr. Brickow, you're formerly chairman of the Department of Clinical Psychology at the university in this city. I was. You're now in private practice. I am. You specialize in a technique known as narcosynthesis? Yes. And what drug is generally used in narcosynthesis? Theopental sodium. Among members of your profession, is theopental sodium sometimes or often referred to as truth serum? Objection. Your Honor, no matter who uses the term, it is a misleading catchphrase. Sustained. You will avoid the phrase truth serum, please. Have you met the defendant, Doctor, Mrs. Louise Broad? Yes. Will you tell the court when and why? On the 17th of last month, Martin Shaw, Mrs. Broad's attorney at the time, made an appointment for me to see her. The purpose was to examine her under theopental sodium. To examine her concerning what? The events experienced by her the 10th of last August. Your Honor, material obtained by so-called truth drugs, or any drug, is not now and never has been admissible as evidence in a court of law. Your Honor, Dr. Brickhouse here is an expert witness. 
The conclusion he reached about Mrs. Broad's confession is the heart of our case. Now, we're not asking that the statements made by Mrs. Broad under narcosynthesis be treated as sworn testimony. They are, however, the data on which an expert witness based his conclusions and are therefore admissible. The court will allow Dr. Brickow to proceed. What procedure did you use in Mrs. Broad's case? I injected a 5% solution of theopental sodium that's relatively strong, at about two cc's per minute. I asked Mrs. Bro to count backward from 100. She began to miscount at 81, then stopped completely in the 70s. When she reached that point, is it your expert opinion that she could not lie? Yes. Under narcosynthesis, the subject synthesizes emotions and memories connected with a given experience into a complete whole, which corresponds to the original experience. Did you suggest to Mrs. Broad that she was about to relive the events of the 10th of last August? I did. She resisted briefly, then began to describe a quarrel with her husband. What was the quarrel about? Divorce, or rather, a divorce settlement, which Mr. Broad refused to grant. She described how he left the room. He shoved her out of his way and went to his own office den. Mrs. Broad put on a coat and left the house to take a walk. She said that. She left the house to take a walk. Yes. On 14th Street, she saw a bar and on impulse went in. On impulse. Those were her words? Yes. She remembered precisely what she ordered. Old fashions. And precisely how many? Four. Then two police officers entered and took her into custody. The rest is a matter of record. Under theopental sodium, did she describe those events? Yes. And did her description correspond in detail to the police report you read this morning? In every detail. Did you ask her why? She confessed to a murder she did not commit. No. I'm afraid she wouldn't have known. The problem was to learn why. For example... I asked her if she had felt sorry her husband was dead. She said no, she had felt happy. Go on. I asked her if she had ever wanted to kill her husband. She said yes, she'd wished him dead many times, dreamed many times that she had actually killed him. Did you ask her if in fact she had killed her husband? Yes. How did she answer? That she had not, but had felt a sense of great exhilaration when she was shown his dead body. Well, isn't that inconsistent with what followed? On the contrary, the exhilaration, the sense of satisfaction, the knowledge that she had wished him dead triggered an enormous guilt reaction, which made her confession a predictable phenomenon. Now, Doctor, is it your opinion that Mrs. Broad's confession is incompatible with the clinical evidence of what actually happened? That is my unqualified opinion. Thank you, Doctor. <laughs> Mr. Brickow, isn't it a matter of fact that some people can lie under theopental sodium? That has never been conclusively demonstrated to me. Your Honor... Prosecution requests that further cross-examination of this witness be deferred in order to give the prosecution time to study the witness's testimony with a possible view to calling expert witnesses into court. How much time will you require? We'll be ready by Monday, Your Honor. Very well. The court is adjourned until Monday at 10 a.m. <laughs> few minutes, I may want to put you on the stand. But, but Marty said I wouldn't have to go on the stand. 
But I just ran into Coleman. He gave me a grin full of confidence and told me what they have waiting for us. Some of the biggest names in psychiatry. I may have to put you on the stand. Nothing to be frightened of, Louise. All you have to do is tell the truth. I was told I wouldn't have to testify. Well, you don't have to. But is that what you want? No matter how it goes in there? Yes. Tell me what you're afraid of. I'm afraid of all those people staring at me. That man Coleman shouting questions. I just wouldn't know what to do. I'd freeze up or I'd... Please don't ask me to do it. Don't make me. I can't make you, Louise. No one can force you to testify. I need your consent. I can't. I'm sorry. <laughs> I might have him wheel that whole contraption right into that courtroom. <laughs> It'd be worth it just to see the expression on, on Coleman's face. <laughs> Paul, what kept you? The jury's been out an hour. Hey, Frankie's been telling me how you handled Coleman's experts. <laughs> I'd have busted the other leg to be there. <laughs> I'm happy you're happy. Uh, Frank, I have something private to discuss with Marty. I could come back. Oh, no, no. My wife's waiting downstairs for me anyway. Give me a call as soon as you hear the jury's back, huh? Just turn on your radio, son. You'll hear it before I do. <laughs> What's the gloomy look for? Well, your assistant's inclined to be a little over-optimistic. It wasn't our day, Marty. Coleman's rebuttal witnesses were filled with fascinating information. What they did to Brickow wasn't pleasant for him. Or for me. Frank tells me you handled it like a veteran. I'm thinking about our law school days. Remember those sessions we used to have? The courtroom is an arena. Two men go into it to do battle... And when the dust clears, one of them's a loser. <laughs> How you hated those losers. <laughs> if I didn't, what kind of lawyer would I be? I remember once, we were working in the DA's office, we were about to do battle, and I kept hammering at you that two lawyers could go into a courtroom fighting. And if they got hold of a bit of truth or a little justice, they both won. So, what are you getting at? That knowing me, and knowing how I feel about the law, you owed it to me not to involve me in a case that isn't on the level. You got some reason to think it isn't? Just enough to ask. And this morning I told Louise I might want to put her on the stand. It scared her to death. Why not? That witness chair is enough to scare anybody. It's not that frightening. Not if all you have to tell is the truth. You don't know that. Maybe I don't. Now here's something else I didn't know. According to Coleman's experts, the Yale Law School ran some experiments. It proved that normal, healthy people can lie under theopental sodium if they've been thoroughly coached ahead of time. Now, that wouldn't violate your code, Marty, to have coached Louise ahead of time, would it? Matter of fact, no. But I didn't. I didn't have to. Then we have no problem. What have I had? What problem would we have? You brought me into this. That's our problem. I'm not your conscience, but I am my own. I'd see to it you never walked into a courtroom again. You're a hypocrite. If you loved the law so damn much, you wouldn't have sold out to go jetting around the world. If I find out you coached Louise Broad before you took her to Brickow, I'll stop jetting around the world long enough... Hello. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for calling. The jury's ready. Before we hear the verdict, I want it clearly understood there will be no pictures taken in this courtroom. No lingering will be permitted. And there will be no talking until I have adjourned this court and left this bench. Has the jury reached a verdict? We have, Your Honor. The defendant, Mrs. Louise Broad, will rise. The clerk will read the verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant, Louise Broad, not guilty. The 
The court thanks the members of the jury. The defendant is released from custody. This honorable court stands adjourned. Congratulations, Louise. That's all. I can go out of that door. And I'll go back to that cell. That's right. Oh, thank you, Paul. Thank you. Do I have to go out past those reporters and those photographers? Oh, I think Judge Kleiner will let us sneak out through his chambers. Better call Marty. She recognized me. Well, you're something of a celebrity now. Better get used to it. I can't believe it. I really can't believe that it's all over now. I've said that before, but... Well, it's not quite true. It isn't entirely over. Oh, there's nothing to be alarmed about. It's just that the district attorney will be talking to you. Probably tomorrow. About what? The murder. You see, the question is back on the books. Who killed your husband? I wonder if we'll ever know. He hurt so many people. Business partners, relatives, friends. I wasn't the only one who hated him. And we didn't have children because he couldn't stand to be in the same room with a child. When I was in that cell, waiting for the trial to begin, I'm wondering if I'd be dead or executed at 34. It suddenly hit me that I'd be married to Harry Broad half my life. Did you know that? I married him when I was 17. I know. Why did you marry him? For all the wrong reasons. It seemed right at the time. He was very important and very rich. My family was unimportant and, and not at all rich. In fact, quite poor. I wonder what it feels like to to love someone and be loved by someone you love. Don't you know? No. I was a faithful wife. I'd like to go now. All right, I'll take you home. No, I want to stay in a hotel. But why? Your servants are still there. It is your home. No reason why you shouldn't go there. I'd just rather not, that's all. Oh, well, you know, if the papers find out you go to a hotel, they'll make a thing of it. You don't even have any luggage or even a toothbrush. I'll tell you what. If it'll make you feel any better, I'll stay in the guest room. <sighs> well, I suppose I have to face it sooner or later. And I'll never get a better offer. I think we need some supportive therapy. Nothing for me, thanks. I've had enough for tonight. For several nights. No, you can't let me drink alone. How long will that go on? Not long. Day or two at the most. Except for the feature writers. But they won't sit on your doorstep.
I can't stay in this house. And I can't face any more reporters. Not tomorrow and not ever. Paul, drive me somewhere. Just check me into a hotel and leave me there. Give the reporters a chance to get away first. as innocent as that jury found you, if not for your sake, then for Marty's. Now, the DA is going to throw the same question at you I did. If you didn't kill your husband, who did? You handled it just fine an hour ago. Now you're coming apart. You owe it to Marty not to let that happen. You must know. It'd be unusual for a lawyer to ask another to take on a case, not tell him everything about it. They uh, won't put a call through at the hospital, not at this time of night. In the morning, we can both go over and see him. You can satisfy yourself then. There's nothing to be frightened about anyway. I mean, even if I were trying to trap you, it wouldn't matter. You can't be tried twice for the same crime. You could hire a hall and boast about how you killed your husband, and there's nothing the law could do. The only one in danger now is Marty. But what do you mean, Marty's in danger? Well, to quote the canons of professional ethics, the office of attorney does not permit the use of fraud or chicane in the defense of a client. Now, when Marty coached you, drilled you in exactly what to say to Dr. Brickow, that was chicane. Could get him disbarred. Even charged with a felony. Why didn't you tell me you knew? Why, Paul? Why didn't you tell me? To God, why didn't you tell me? A client is entitled to the best defense a lawyer can give. I gave it, and I'm not ashamed of it. And don't talk ethics to me. What about you? You think what you did to her was ethical? I got the truth, finally. And since I don't have your low opinion of the truth... I don't think it was unethical to get it. Oh, Marty. You had a chance to level with me. I would have refused to do it, but I would have let you be your own conscience. Now I have to do what I told you. And what's that? Just what I said. See to it you never walk into a court of law again. And how do you bring that off? I file a complaint to the state bar asking for disciplinary proceedings. You're out of your mind. What is it? Revenge? Because I involve you in something that offends your gentle sensibilities? Because you don't believe in winning unless you can do it the way they taught us at law school? Maybe they didn't teach you anything. Don't you know there's nothing you can do? Zero, cipher, nothing? What Louise told you was a privileged communication, old bleeding heart, buddy. Say one word about that, you will be disbarred. Not me. I don't intend to use what she said. Never did. You've admitted you coached her. That's all my report will say. You all want to her to keep quiet. No. I owe her more than that. Paul. 
Listen to me. You don't understand criminal law. It's a different kind of a ball game. You've got to go in there to win. Use every stratagem, every angle. You owe that to your client. If you're not prepared to give it, you don't belong in criminal law. The prosecutors go into court with the same idea. Win. Use any angle you can get away with, but win. You really believe that? You think Phil Coleman would rig a case? And Coleman's only one of you. You're saying I shouldn't have defended her because I knew she was guilty. The code of ethics says different. It says use every remedy and right you can get your hands on, every defense the law allows. That doesn't include fraud. But you didn't stop there. You made me a part of it. You made me the one who brought it off. But that isn't even it. I could still walk away from this. But, Marty, next time you could let loose a pathological killer. I can't walk away from that. File a charge against me, and you're going to think you're in a cage of wounded tigers. They can call Louise as a witness, but she'll back me up, not you. That hearing will be all there is left for you, friend, a big bag of grief. It's too bad. I'll just have to live with it. I'll uh, leave you with a quote from Edmund Burke. Where mystery begins, justice ends. Operator, get me five 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 seven eight one zero. Hello? Louise. Y yes? This is Marty. Get out of the house as fast as you can. Take a taxi to the center of town. And then walk to the Hancock Hotel. Check in there under the name of uh, Helen Reese. What hotel? The Hancock. Uh, it's a flea bag on 4th Street. What's wrong? Don't ask questions. Just get out of there fast. I'll call you at the hotel under that name. Helen Reese. Get going. Bringing you the 6 p.m. news. The big story on the local scene today is the sensational aftermath of the Louise Broad trial. Paul Bryan, who replaced attorney Martin Shaw after a skiing accident, today filed a complaint against Shaw with the state bar. The exact nature of the complaint has not been revealed, and Bryan has declined to make any comment. Also, as of this hour, the whereabouts of Louise Broad is apparently unknown. However, our reporter Jerry Stanley, earlier this afternoon, was able to interview Martin Shaw at the Holt Memorial Hospital. The complaint filed today by Paul Bryan contains a false and preposterous charge. Bryan's motive in making the charge is known to me, but I shall make no comment on that unless this complaint leads to a formal hearing by the state bar. Something I am certain will never occur. A spokesman for the state bar stated today that Brian's complaint will be examined by staff attorneys. Now, this is an accumulative list, Mr. Brian. At a rough guess, I'd say we've covered about a third of the hotels in the general area. I've already received reports on the checkout of these two. The answer is negative. This one's being checked out now. We should hear any minute. And the same man is checking this one. That's a long shot. Well, can't you put more girls on this thing? <laughs> Got five girls on it now. They're doing all right. You want more girls? I gotta put in more phones. I see. Look, Mr. Bryan, if you're right and she is in this area, we're gonna find her. Why don't you go out and get something to eat? Maybe have a drink. No, I'll stick around. I'd like to be near your optimism. <laughs> That's not optimism. After all, no matter what name she uses, she's got the kind of face that people notice, especially desk clerks. It's a face that isn't exactly unfamiliar around here. You mind if I ask you a foolish question? Why not? If you're right, then it's probably Martin Shaw who's got her stashed away. Check? Check. Then what good is it going to do you to find her? <laughs> when do you ask the foolish question? Mr. Hanson, I think we found her. Good.
Five 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 four four seven three. Well, you won't find him at the hospital. He checked out two hours ago. Please connect me with Martin Shaw's room. Oh, I see. Thank you. And you won't find him at home. I checked before I came here. Louise, you'll talk to me. Or two investigators of the state bar. There's someone with me here. In ten seconds, he'll leave to call them. I have nothing to say to you. But I have something to say to you. I think you'd better hear it. All right, get it over with. Please sit down. What I have to say to you is important. It may save your life. Look, Marty told me my rights. I've got nothing to worry about from you or from anyone else. You've got plenty to worry about. Are you trying to frighten me? Try to help you. Now, when you were arrested in that bar, why did you confess to killing your husband? Tell me why. Killed him. And there didn't seem anything else that I could do. But admit it. No. At headquarters, you were advised very carefully not to talk to anyone until you saw your lawyer. But you insisted on confessing for a second time. You had to repeat it, didn't you? And sign it. Because you're not a psychopath. You're not a killer. You didn't plan to kill him, did you? No, it wasn't planned. But I did kill him. That's all I came to say. You can't live with a verdict Marty Shaw got you. Tell the truth at the hearing on Friday. I think you can live with that verdict. You want me to tell the world that I killed a man? Yes. You want me to testify against Martin Shaw? Help you put down a man who saved my life? He didn't save your life. How much sleep have you gotten since that jury found you innocent? Marty stole from you what you needed most, and he did it for himself to win another case. Yes, an honest defense would have meant a verdict of guilty, murder in the second degree, but you would have been paroled in four or five years. Even from a life sentence, you would have been paroled. There is no parole from the sentence Marty gave you. You don't have to accept it. But the sentence could have been the gas chamber. How do you get paroled from that? How do they parole you from a grave in a prison cemetery? There was never any chance of that. It wasn't that kind of crime. But Marty never told you that, did he? He had to get you off anything less and he would have been a loser. He never gave a thought to what it would make you. I've listened to you. Now get out, please. At the hearing, you'll make a statement under oath. Tell the truth and the world will know you killed a man and got away with it. That won't be easy to live with. But you will live. Having taken an oath to tell the truth at this hearing, you should understand that the laws of perjury will apply to your testimony in the same manner as if this were a court of law. 
I have informed the witness, Mr. Examiner, of her rights and obligations at this hearing. Thank you, Mr. Cotton. Now, Mrs. Brood, have you uh, read the uh, complaint as filed by Mr. Bryan? Yes, I have. Uh -huh. Now, in reference to that part of the complaint which states that Mr. Shaw admitted to Mr. Bryan that he coached you in order to deceive an expert witness, would you tell this committee, please, whether or not such coaching occurred? No, it did not. Was it Mr. Shaw who suggested that you be questioned under narcosynthesis? Yes. Did he tell you that he thought you might deny a confession under the influence of a drug? No. I had told him that I wasn't sure of what really had happened that night. That I felt that I might not have done it. And he decided to call in Dr. Brickow. Mr. Bryan, do you have any questions for the witness? No, no question. Mr. Carter, any questions? Yes. Mrs. Broad, will you tell the committee members what occurred on the evening the trial ended? What occurred after Mr. Bryan took you home? We went into the study where Mr. Bryan made me a drink. I had told him earlier that I felt uneasy, and he had suggested that he stay there that night in the guest room. After making the drinks, he came over and sat beside me on the couch. And he kissed me. And, well, I had had drinks at a club earlier, and perhaps I responded more than I should have. Anyway, Mr. Bryan, I feel, got the wrong impression. And he finally became very aggressive, and I insisted that he leave. He apologized. And I asked if he could take me upstairs to my room. Please continue. He took me up to my bedroom. And there again, he... Well, I wouldn't say that he tried to assault me. It was just that he became very aggressive. And I finally had to ask him to get out of my house. I'm afraid that I revealed that I was disgusted with him. Did he leave, Mrs. Broad? He left my bedroom, but he seemed very angry. I heard the guest room door open and close, and then I decided I wouldn't try to do anything more because I'd, I'd had enough ugly publicity. Mr. Bryan left in the morning without speaking to me. And then the next thing that I heard was that he had filed this complaint against Mr. Shaw. Mr. Bryan, do you have any questions for Mrs. Broad? No, I have no questions for Mrs. Broad. You're still under oath. You wish to deny the statements Mrs. Broad just made? No. Does that mean that you affirm what the witness has just said? No. You neither deny nor confirm the statements Mrs. Broad has just made? What's the basis for that refusal? I don't want to deny or confirm anything, that's all. I prefer to let the record speak for itself. That's very unusual. But may the record so show. Mr. Carter, does Mr. Shaw wish to make a statement? No. We feel that the puzzle of Mr. Bryan's complaint against Mr. Shaw has been cleared up beyond the need for any further comment. You gentlemen have any questions you want to put to the witness or the respondee or Mr. Bryan? The committee will meet and draw up its recommendations, which will be submitted to the Board of Bar Governors. The transcript of this hearing will... Please.
I can't. I'm sorry I didn't hear you, Mrs. Broad. The testimony that I gave here was not the truth. Mrs. Broad. Just a minute, Mr. Carter. This meeting has not been adjourned. Uh, please continue. I was coached by Mr. Shaw for over a week before I saw Dr. Brickell. Mr. Examiner, I request to recess to allow me to discuss this development with Mr. Shaw. Do you have any objections, Mr. Bryan? No. If I may ask Mrs. Broad a question first. You may. You were coached to do what? To make Dr. Brickell believe that I hadn't killed my husband. And had you? Yes. yourself? No. But not ashamed either. I should have put you away for life. Maybe you should have. I'd give anything. Everything if you had just defended me. You owed me that. It was my trial, not yours. Thank you all. 